In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Today we're going to be talking about the multiplication of loaves and fishes, or the feeding of the 5,000 from Matthew's account. One of the funny things about this text is the way that the death of John the Baptist is mentioned at the very front end, when Jesus heard it. John suddenly disappears the minute that Jesus starts to preach, and the story of the beheading of John the Baptist is the ultimate end of all preachers. They end up in jail with their head on a platter. Now when Jesus hears this, he does something very typical of, of preachers. He withdraws and goes to a desolate, desolate place by himself. This happens with Moses, it happens with Elijah, and it happens with Paul most famously. Matthew, in telling the story of the feeding of the 5,000, is also telling us how to read the Old Testament. Specifically, we have two key ideas in the feeding of the 5,000. One is that God is interested in all of you. He takes care of all of you, body and soul. That means the feeding of your body and also feeding your soul. We see this in Moses, who both preached the word and cared for people's bodily needs. God is interested in preserving your body, and he is going to give the word that does not end, even when the body itself comes to an end. The second thing is the direct relationship between Jesus and Moses. One of the key ways the gospel tells us who Jesus is, is by comparing Jesus to Moses. This is where modern interpretation is, that Matthew is trying to tell you that Jesus is a rabbi, a rabbi above all rabbis, that he's a teacher above teachers, that he is a Moses who out Moses Moses. But that is wrong. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is directly compared to Moses. But Matthew is not saying that Jesus is a new, better Moses. Matthew himself knows that with the arrival of Jesus, Moses comes to an end. Jesus is not a souped-up Moses. Jesus does not come to give a better form of Moses. He is actually now going to bring Moses to an end. So as Moses withdrew, Jesus withdrew. He got into a boat, and he went to a desolate place, a wilderness. It's the same word used in Exodus for the wilderness and the wandering in the wilderness. So Jesus is out in the wilderness, and when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. How does Jesus respond to the crowd? He doesn't have the usual response of the disciples, which is to be irritated with the crowds. He has compassion. You'll remember this in contrast to Exodus 16, which is the story of manna, or the, account, or the account in Numbers 11, the same story. But there is a difference in the story of manna and Israel, or the Israelites, and the crowds in today's gospel. How do the Israelites respond to the manna, and how is Moses caught up in it? Eventually, the Israelites complain about the manna. They don't like it. They want the leeks and the melons that they ate in Egypt. This is one of the key things in the whole, this is one of the key things in the whole Old Testament. The people of God, the chosen people, the ones who have been freed from slavery, then enter the wilderness with their unfaith. And their unfaith is recognized in the word that keeps coming up over and over again. Complaining. The complaint is that they remember the meat pots of Egypt. They remember that the leek soup was fabulous. If you've been in the wilderness this long and you say, well, you know, it's true that we were slaves in Egypt, but at least we came home and we had leek soup. Now we can't even do that. So we hear their complaints that come out of the lack of faith that God himself will provide for their bodies. But you remember the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer and praying for daily bread. God wants us to come to him with the prayer for daily bread. And that prayer for daily bread comes out of trust and faith. 
It doesn't come out of complaints, because complaining does not hold that God himself is, our, is your creator, and the creator is providing daily bread. Unbelief thinks that it will not have the daily bread. It has it now, but it doesn't trust that it will tomorrow. It has no trust. Complaints come out of a lack of faith. A lament trusts the promise. We are given to lament, but not complain. The thing that's similar between a complaint and a lament is that a person is suffering. A person is in fear or difficulty. That's the thing that's the same. But lament holds on to the promise, and the complaint does not. And this, of course, is now going to be the difference between the law and gospel. The gospel is the thing that faith holds on to. In the feeding of the 5,000, we learn what faith actually trusts or holds on to. It is not holding on to the command or the law of God. It is holding to the promise that has been given and, in fact, will be given again. But you also remember the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In the manna account in Numbers 11, there are many references to the Sabbath. That is the place in the scriptures where the Sabbath begins. And what the Sabbath means begins here. You'll eventually get the third commandment explicitly when Moses comes down from Sinai. The Sabbath is very clearly made for you. You remember that this comes up famously when Jesus, with Jesus when Jesus is scolded for healing on the Sabbath. And then he says, but the man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. That's also Numbers 11. That's even Moses. Even Moses knew that. But here's the beginning of the complaint for Moses. Many times Moses says to God, I can't stand this because I am bearing the weight of the complaints of all these people and I can't take it. So he actually turns to God and he says, I do not want to bear their weight. This is the key difference between Moses and Jesus. Moses will not take your sin. He has a limit on how much he will bear with you just like your pastor, by the way. The only one who can bear with you all the way to the end is Jesus Christ. Even the pastor is going to bail on this particular matter of complaints, except that the pastor actually gives, except when the pastor actually gives the gospel. Of course, the pastor will say, I'm walking with you in the, in the difficulties of your life and so on. But he has his limits, and the pastor will finally get fed up with your, with your grumbling. But the faithful pastor will not fail in the delivery of the proclamation and the bestowal of the gospel. When it comes to the bearing of the sins, your pastor is quite right. That's on Jesus. In Jesus' compassion, we see he is already different than Moses. Israel tried to put their complaints on Moses. They went to Moses and complained. Then Moses turned to God and said, I'm not going to carry these complaints. God actually accepted that and then went through the process of giving manna. Moses wasn't going to sit there and take that complaining for too long. But in contrast, Jesus bears the complaints and has compassion. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. <clears throat> Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. You'll notice how the disciples complain, just like the Israelites did to Moses. So the disciples are coming to Jesus in the same way that the Israelites did to Moses. But look how Jesus handles it. They say, this is a desolate place. The day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And this, of course, is in direct opposition to Isaiah 55, the Old Testament text, where you go into the market and you buy without money. What they want is for these crowds to be dispersed, get away, and let them go and use their own money for their own buying. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. So there's your first sign 
how he's going to operate in a way that's different even than Moses. Well, that is so far just like the story of manna. But they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. The normal way that unfaith operates is to say that there's too little. It measures according to the law. Measuring according to the law, of course, uses money, economics, to identify the value and the amount of something. And so what they're doing, of course, is putting this in front of God and complaining about what he gave them in the same way that the Israelites complained to Moses about the manna. But look at how Jesus is going to operate without money. And he's going to operate in a kingdom that has no economics in it whatsoever. The difference of the two kingdoms becomes very important here because of this world we have only economics. In the world of the new kingdom of Jesus Christ, there is no economics. This is what it means to have no law there. So what does it look like when we have a kingdom without the law? No Moses? Jesus said, bring them here, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. Remember that Moses described to the Israelites how they were going to receive the manna? Gather the manna one day a week. Don't keep any extra over. If you do, then you are not trusting God to provide, and all of it is going to be filled with worms and actually kill you rather than keep you alive. And so Jesus seems to be setting, up, setting it up in the same way. But when he turns to heaven and he says a blessing, a blessing is the Old Testament word for the gospel. The gospel is the opposite of a curse. One of the chief ways that law and gospel is referred to in the Old Testament is the difference between getting a curse and getting a blessing. So here Jesus is, give, is going to give his blessings and omits any curse. He broke the bread and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. So again, the, importance, the important features of the feeding of the 5,000 is that God really is interested in your body, and he's interested actually in providing food, not theoretically or in terms of a sign, but he really wants food for you, and he really is going to provide it. But that's not properly the church's job. It's probably best not to take your church and make it the form of a producer of food because the local farmers are really the ones who are doing that. And they are the ones that should be identified as the way that daily bread is given. Along with the merchants in your town, along with your own father and mother who make your meals for you. God is in fact the one providing for this. And most especially, however, God and Jesus Christ is providing the promise. When he provides the promise, then he's giving out just this world's bread and fish, but he's giving a word that will not die. He's giving a word that creates you so that you yourself will not die. And therefore, you have soul care as well, eternal life. And the church and her preachers aren't just setting before you a picnic for people and try to feed, to, and try to feed their bellies. It's okay to have a potluck, no doubt. But we want to make sure that we're giving the promises of Jesus to them so that they hear clearly that they are chosen by God, that Christ is present, that Christ is speaking, and that his promise is the thing now that will never leave you hungry. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the canticle. 